the science of location technology um, is an emerging technology. And while it's been around for a while, not everyone quite get, gets the, the true value. Um, and even though we all use it every day, we all use our maps on our phones and everything else, we don't necessarily think about GIS so much as a science. So what we're looking to do um, in these several iterations um, <clears throat> is to share with you just the insights of some of these technologies, some of the, the different tools that we use out in the field and how this can <clears throat> move your business forward. Um, for today, we'll have a couple um, presentations. Um, we're gonna have uh, James from IGIS, uh, Joel um, from Leica, uh, Valerie Dantra will also be speaking, and um, <clears throat> we're gonna have uh, Mr. Bobiti from Scient. So, we're gonna be spending the next two hours together. Um, looking forward to your questions at the end. Um, and with that, let us jump right in. Um, Josiah, back over to you. All right, thank you, Terry. Um, just some reminders, uh, persons may have just joined in, just welcome again uh, to our first stop of our virtual roadshow. We are about to start. Um, just general rules, you know, keep your mics muted. And any questions you have, you can put it in the chat. We have persons monitoring the chat. We will, you know, give a short Q&A after each presentation, and then we'll have a bigger Q&A at the end. Um, there's also a link to a survey in the chat. I'll remind persons throughout the presentations as well. That's for you to guys to fill out, um, to kind of get an idea as to, you know, how you can benefit from our giveaways. We'll be choosing some lucky winners as well, and you guys will be contacted once you fill out that survey, you stay to the end, we identify you, we'll contact you. So with that, um, let's begin. I'll introduce our first speaker. So Mr. Joel Hurt, Vice President, Industrial Plant Relations, North America with Leica Geosystem, leads a team of subject matter experts responsible for and specializing in technology solutions for the industrial plant, in the, the industrial plant industry. Further, Mr. Hurt manages business development for mergers, acquisitions, and partnering for Leica Geosystems, North America. Mr. Hurt has been a global leader in developing and driving laser scanning technology for over 15 years. Prior to Leica Geosystems, Joel was the president and COO of Visilimage, also specializing in laser technology. Additionally, Mr. Hurt has worked extensively within engineering design industry. Joel executed key roles with major engineering companies and projects around the world with 20 plus years with Bechel, Bechtel, Raytheon, and Jacobs Engineering. Mr. Hurt, a mechanical engineer, a contributing author to various international publications and alumnus of Texas Southern University. Joel brings a vast amount you know, of the practical real world field experience as well as insight as a leading edge technological innovator. So with that, I want to hand over to you. Thank you, thank you. That's a lot, man. I, I'm I'm even tired now, man. Sorry. I was thinking about something my... else to say, though, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can get my slides up here. I will share my computer sound and share, and hopefully it will start soon. Can everyone see my slides, please? Yes, we can. It's not in presenter view, though, um, Joel. Yeah, I have started it. Ah, there we go. Okay. How is that? Yes, it's good. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Josiah. Thank you. And thank you to Geotech Vision for this virtual uh, road, so, uh, road show. Uh, we're having virtual road shows today because of uh, the current situation we're in. As, as Terry mentioned, this is uh, changing times we're in. So I'd like to start with a quick safety note. I hope everyone is staying safe. 
Uh, it is very difficult times. Uh, I've actually had loved ones within my family lost due to the uh, COVID virus. So it's very dear to me. So please, everyone, stay safe. Just a quick agenda. Uh, the proverbial commercial, I like to say who Leica Hexagon is. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, the technology. What's the value of this type of technology? Uh, share some case studies with you as well and do some Q&A. So I might go kind of fast. Out of respect for my fellow presenters, I don't want to run over my time. So if I go fast, if I go over something or you have some additional questions, please do bring them up at the end or reach out to my friends at Geotech Vision for some additional information. So once again, who am I? As Josiah said, I've got uh, 20 plus years in engineering, 20 plus years in uh, emerging technologies and groundbreaking technology. That makes me sound very old. Uh, I hope not, but uh, I do have a lot of experience. Uh, so who's Hexagon? Hexagon is the parent company of Leica. Uh, we're a global leader in sensor and, and software and automation technologies, and we're really, really committed to empowering the autonomous future. Uh, we believe that's where the future lies, and that's where we're looking to go. And so how did we really get there, and what are we going to be talking about today? So what do we look at in autonomous solutions is reality capture. We're talking about positioning, right? Uh, as, as we started the, the conversation around GIS, we're talking about autonomous technologies, design and uh, simulation, uh, location intelligence mapping. These are all the things that we bring into play and with our partners at Geotech Vision, our answers for you as well. Uh, some of the areas that we play in, it probably touches everyone on this, on this, on this, uh, on this chat, or on this video. Uh, industrial facilities manufacturing is where I specialize in, uh, where my background comes from, primarily in petrochemical and nuclear engineering. But we also touch mining, agriculture, mobility, uh, buildings and infrastructure, cities and, and nations being like public safety, utilities. We touch all those things. And just to mention about mobility and phones, uh, opening Terry mentioned looking at the maps on our phones. I am willing to bet that the majority of people on this call did not know the majority of that technology comes from Hexagon. All the maps, all that GIS data, a lot of it comes from Hexagon. So, so who is Hexagon, right, and, and what do we do? And I just wanted to share some really fun facts that I thought were really cool. Uh, did you know over half of all oil and gas and chemical products worldwide are delivered more efficiently and effectively due to Hexagon technologies? So here's our couple of numbers. 75% of the cars produced are actually touched by hexagon technology. 90% of aircraft produced, 85% of smartphones produced uses our technology. That's pretty impressive. Uh, hexagon is the only company to solve surface and underground challenges with proven technologies for planning, operations, and safety. And I'll talk about some of those uh, as, as we go along. Uh, hexagon Autonomous stuff, that's actually the name of a company. I'm not being facetious when I say autonomous stuff, but autonomous stuff is a leading player in the autonomous space for nearly a decade now. And we're building 20 to 60 development cars a month at, at, for at least several years now. Outside of my office in California, uh, yes, I am California based. It's early in California. And contrary to belief, we do get up before 11 o'clock before we have two coffees and start work. It's actually around 10 o'clock, no. Uh, but these are things that we do on a regular basis here at Hexagon. Over half the Earth's geospatial images is collected through the process that we use. Almost 1 billion people on the planet are protected by Hexagon Public Safety Solutions. Uh, pretty impressive, I have to say. And Leica, uh, who, as I said, is uh, a company of hexagons. We're a 200-year-old company, uh, beginning, beginning back in 1819 as the current company, and we've progressed through today to bring about digital solutions that I think changes the world and touches the world, which is really important to me. So that's the obligatory commercial. Let's really get into talking about some substance today. I, I'm going fast once again, but if I miss something, please reach out later. I've been told that a virtual rock will be thrown at me if I start to go over my time. But every day, 
the world creates more than 2.5 a trillion bytes of data. That sounds like a lot of data. Really, it does. How much is it? That's 18 zeros. That's a heck of a lot of data. Uh, and we're creating more and more each day. For example, Google now processes more than 40,000 searches every second, and that's only from mobile devices. 40,000 searches every second, only for mobile devices. Every minute of the day, and here are some additional numbers I can share with you. Snapchat users share over a half million photos, a half, close to a half million photos every minute. More than 120 professionals join LinkedIn. Users watch 4 million YouTube videos every minute of the day. 456,000 tweets are sent on Twitter and Instagram posts 46,000 photos every minute. We're pushing a lot of data out there now. Data is information. With, with good information, you make good choices. So let's talk about that 2.5 quadrillion bytes of data. So the majority of it, as I mentioned, is 2D data, flat data that comes primarily from social, social media, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Google, et cetera, et cetera. But what about real world data? You know, what about the engineering data out there, things that we touch every day, that real tactical world that, that we're in? What about that geospatial data? Where does that come from and what can we do? I mean, this is a lot of data and we're not even counting all the data that comes from there. And this is where I believe that like with geosystems and geotech vision, can really help. So we can look at where this is coming from, how we can touch that engineering world and where that geodata spatial comes in at. But first of all, how is this real world data created? So this is what I'm talking about. I want to share this image with you just really quick. It looks like a, a photograph, but actually this is what's called a point cloud. This is gathered from a 3D laser scanner, reality capture which I'm going to be talking more in detail about as I go throughout the presentation. So just keep this in mind, the fidelity and clearness of this. So there's many different types of sensors out there to capture to this data, to bring this data to you. So there's backpacks that you can put on and as you're walking, it's capturing data. There's terrestrials or static data, as some people like to call it. These sensors stay in one place and they capture data in 360 degrees by 270. Um, at the bottom, you see what looks like a lawnmower. It's not a lawnmower. Actually, it's ground penetrating LIDAR. It actually penetrates the ground and captures pipes, technology that's underneath there, and brings it in so you can make real world decisions. UAVs, we know, are being used quite extensively now. Um, handhelds, uh, walking scanners. There's so many things along with total stations that allow you to capture the real world. So where, where, where I'm going to focus today is on 3D laser scanning and looking at some of these products here and the software that goes along with it because it's very important not only to capture, but to be able to use it. So let's first talk about how it works. Hi, I'm Alex. And I'm Lori. As the market leader in laser scanning, Leica Geosystems is uniquely positioned to further educate you about how it all works and how we can help you succeed. In this Chapter 2 video, we'll look closer at the field work, the office part, and our outstanding support team. Let's start with the field work, Alex. Right. There are different types of scanners, but they all work on the same basic principle. The technology is advanced, but it's designed to be easy to use. A laser scanner emits a rapidly pulsing or continuous laser beam. As it emits the beam, the scanner automatically rotates around its vertical axis, and a rapidly spinning or oscillating mirror also moves the beam up and down. The result is a systematic sweeping of the beam over the area. When the beam hits an object, some of its energy bounces back to the scanner, where if the returned energy signal is strong enough, a sensor detects it and a timer uses it to calculate the distance from the scanner to the object. But there's more to 3D scanning than just measuring distances, isn't there? 
Yes, for each distance measurement, additional critical data is recorded, including the corresponding horizontal angle of the rotating laser and the corresponding vertical angle of the moving mirror. The scanner automatically combines these to calculate a 3D X, Y and Z coordinate position for each point. The resulting scan is a set of 3D coordinate measurements. It's a detailed 3D representation of the scene, often called a point cloud. And to add realistic texture or color to scans, matching photos can be taken. Can you tell us how that's done? Sure. Using either a camera that's built into the scanner or using an external camera and automatically merging the photos with scan data. Scans can also be easily geo-referenced to local coordinate systems, just like conventional surveys. Now, what if you need to capture an entire scene where some views may be obstructed? Or if a site is so big that the scanner can't reach all of it with one scan? Right. In those cases, which are very typical, the scanner is moved to different vantage points for more scans. The best vantage points will be based on site logistics and scanner capabilities. Multiple scans can be automatically aligned with each other. Can you help us understand how that's done? Well, if the scanner is properly equipped, this registration step can be done right on board the scanner. Otherwise, you can do this later by post-processing the set of scans. In fact, users have several convenient options for... Great. I wanted to stop there. I didn't want to go too long into this, but it gives you an idea of what the laser scanning does. It is a line of sight device. It captures everything it sees. That which it cannot see, you simply move the scanner and it captures it again. But there's many types of scanners that, uh, that can be used. Uh, we have scanners uh, that have a one kilometer range uh, that allows you to reach very far. It's used quite a bit in the movie industry. So if any of you have seen Harry Potter or The Matrix or The Spider-Man, uh, these are all done with Leica technology uh, in the Harry Potter case, they scanned the castle and then everything is CG'd in. The same thing with the Matrix that was done right here in the Oakland area. Spider-Man was done by one person actually out of uh, Southern California who walked the streets of New York with the crew scanning. So very easy and very simple technology. The, the next one has a 270 uh, meter range, a million points per second. It's used quite a bit in ground survey outside, being able to capture roads or tracks or things of that nature to help you understand the topography around which you're working in. The next one, the RTC 360 is a 2 million points per second with 130 meter range. Remember in the video, it mentioned that it does XYZ coordinates. That means that every point that is captured has an XYZ coordinates, which means you can measure very accurately. This is used in law enforcement, for example, or in homicides, issues in refineries and in food manufacturing or food and bed manufacturing and tank scanning to under, understand tanks, to understand deformation of tanks, uh, volumetrics, things of that nature. And then we have the BLK360, which is a shorter range, 60 meters, it's kind of an entry level, and it can encompass any of these actual applications. This is what a point cloud looks like. I, I gave you a view of a point cloud earlier, but I want to give you all the different views because it can be in color. It can be in this orangish color. Uh, a lot of people like to work in this orangish yellow color that's shown in the center. What that is is the intensity returned. Remember, it's a laser. A laser is nothing but light. It's amplified light. So it sends out a light signal. It comes back. And as you know from high school, dark colors absorb light. Lighter colors reflect light. So the darker the, the object is, the less light that's going to come back because it's going to be absorbed. So that's what you see there in different colors. To the upper right, those are scans with images over the top. And the bottom right, which is very interesting, is a hybrid because with point cloud data, you can have point cloud and CAD model data. So you can actually see how this new facility is going to work. Say, for example, if you're making additions to a, a plant you'd be able to see how that works. If there's intrusions, uh, if there are collisions, you can capture it on the screen versus capturing in the field, which is much more expensive. So why is this technology relevant? And I'm gonna share another quick video with it. You might recognize uh, a person in here. In our world, the industrial world, the life cycle continues. 
As we know, these plants today, they're always moving, always changing every single day. And trying to keep up with it is a challenge. But it all starts with laser scanning. It captures it, it time stamps it, uh, and it's been being documented. You have much more fidelity. You have much more depth in what you capture, regardless of it's food and bev, oil and gas, automotive, shipbuilding, pulp and paper. It has applicability in all of those. I'll give you a couple examples. In the automotive industry, they're using 3D laser scanning to understand retooling of lines to facilitate and move automobiles and parts through the factory faster. In food and bev industry, they're using it to understand relocation. If we have to put in, oh, a new conveyor, a new line, with 3D laser scanning, you can do that without having to shut down the line. We can use predictive analysis to understand what we're going through. I mean, with laser scanning, the idea is, is you want to capture it one time and one time only, and it's, it's your first ROI out of the gate is you're saving the revisits to your project. Many times in the past, myself, when I was in engineering, had to send myself or our crews back and forth to the site. Did we get enough information? Something can be easily missed, whether it's not enough measurements or the scope of the project may change too, and which happens quite often. With 3D laser scanning, not only are you capturing everything in your environment and making it measurable, you actually have full fidelity, you have 3D imagery, just like a CAD model, but it is real world. In a CAD model, all pipes are orthogonal, but in the real world, in the plant, I bet you cannot find an orthogonal pipe. There's gonna be sags, you're gonna need supports, shoes. You not only look at it from a one direction, you can move around the tank 360 degrees. You can look above the tank, below the tank. You can get every aspect of that tank to make a very informed and intelligent decision. If the customer has a design that they would like to use that and see, does this interfere out in the real world, rather than spending all the time out in the field, try to field fit things because that can become very, very costly. Yeah, in, in typical measurements, there are things that you don't necessarily captured. So in a tank, for example, a tank can have a dent. You really don't see that, but in 3D laser scanning, you can capture that information. You can look at verticality. You can look at plumbness and roundness of a tank. You can also do meshing to capture volume metrics. You can also look at space environment. You can look at installations and you can do conceptual drawings and details using this technology. Within Leica Geosystems, we have built software that allows it to be very easy and simple for you to use your existing CAD tools in conjunction with point clouds. With CloudWorks, you are able to open point clouds within your existing CAD tool, allowing you to get to a deliverable much faster. In our world, we really want clean data, things off of uh, stainless steel, like in this environment here. Uh, stainless steel has always been a nemesis of laser scanning and so you always get that reflectivity even on the other side of the spectrum with anything that is black in color it just like as always absorbs the laser it's just tough to get data off of that so we get a really good return off that so the RTC 360 does a phenomenal job the very clean data uh, we get a half a millimeter noise out at 50 meters and uh, getting clean data off stainless steel is phenomenal so one of the great things about the RTC 360 laser scanner is this ease of use. What makes that compelling is that you do not need to hire extra crews. It's just another tool in the toolbox of someone at your office or at your facility. It's very simple. You take the scanner, you go out, you push the button, you capture data. This is something that like a geosystem has built into the technology. We have made it easy to use. But one of the great things about 3D laser scanning is reducing downtime. The less time in the facility equals safety. The less time you have a subcontractor or even an employee in a hazardous area, the better it is for OSHA, for your safety record, for that individual. Speed gets you in and out very quickly. Well, nowadays with the technology that we have, even the onboard pre-registration tools with the Viz, it's amazing the amount of time that is saved. So uh, it's all about a faster workflow in the field and even in the process now and uh, with the ability to share this data through the cloud for QA, QC checks it may be, or other final deliverables. 
in today's very competitive industrial plant, we really need solutions that allow us to give very quick and very accurate decisions. This allows us to respond quicker and to reduce downtime and mitigate risk. It has tools that you can use in the field that's valuable when you get back in the office. For example, you can take your iPad, go out and take a picture of a key area. If there's a valve, if there's a pump that's of value, you can literally take a picture of that valve, pump, or whatever that piece of equipment may be, and is instantly tied to your point cloud. It might be that your uh, management might need it for asset management. Uh, you can take this and you can create fly-throughs. You can add hyperlinks to what we call geotags. They're basically placeholders that have information. Now that I can virtually walk through my facility, I'll be able to click on, on uh, maybe a geotag, which is a placeholder, and it'll pull up a live operations report. It could be uh, an inspection report. It could be a photograph of a certain valve or a pump that may be reflect to the manufacturers. Anything is at my fingertips. What about shutting down a bypass? You can use laser scanning to show where it is in the facility and then videotape it with your iPad and tie it to your point cloud. Now anyone anywhere that you give access to can now view that data. No one has to come into your plant. They can sit remotely and key in to your actual facility. A lot of our customers, they have plants located all around the world, whether they're stateside or not. <clears throat> and logistically, just to plan and to get around and try to get things, it's all about timing. But now they can virtually visit the, their digital twin, is what we call it. It's physically taking their facility and bringing it to them, to their fingertips at their desktop. There's no more efficient way to get data into your digital twin than through laser scanning. Very nice. I like that guy. He's a pretty cool guy. So just a reminder of time as well. We have like two more minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll go through this very quickly. There's various softwares that's used to capture this information, to share this out. Um, Cloudworks, for example, allows you to work within uh, CAD files. All this can be found out on our website or contact our friends, as I mentioned, at, uh, Ge at Geotech Vision. Some of the value of the technology, just really quickly, is the digital twin. Uh, a digital twin can be used to analyze and simulate the real world, uh, respond to changes, uh, improve operations. Uh, digital twin can be a, a proxy. Uh, the laser scanning I believe is the currency uh, for the digital twin. Uh, there's asset management where you can actually use this to uh, manage your data uh, within the plant to understand where you are. And this is very important during COVID because many facilities are only at 50% staffing. Using this type of technology allows you a window into your plant. I'm gonna go past this pretty quickly. AR, VR is one of the hottest things and exciting things out there. Virtual reality technology uh, allows you to test philosophies, theories, without actually having to put yourself into that environment. Uh, I believe this is the genesis of the real world conditions is laser scanning. Uh, some quick case studies. Once again, because of COVID and things like this, you can actually visit your plant virtually. Uh, you don't have to be there. You can access it from your computer, from your tablet, or from your handheld phone device. Here are a couple of quick examples. Uh, this project was 19% on the budget. They established new safety. And on time, shutdown and startup was the key. Here's a quick video. Once again, this one is just showing point clouds and how you can use this interactively to understand where there's a possible problem. This is a train and it's showing a possible collision before it actually happens. You can use this to get smart before you actually go out into the field. Uh, and if you want to go out to YouTube, I won't show this one, but this is Ford Motors using the Boston Dynamics spot dog with a laser scanning on top of it to be able to walk through the plant, capture data, and then share it back. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joanne.
Um, unfortunately, we are pressed for time, but we will have a, a, a Q&A segment also at the end of all presentations. We'll have one in between, but we'd just like to move to the next speaker quickly um, so we can stay on time. So I'd like to inter introduce Mr. James Pardew. James is the Senior Vice President of Sales of the Spike Business Unit at Ike GPS. He is a geospatial industry veteran with 28 years of distinguished service at the world's leading geospatial firms, including Space Imaging, TomTom, Tom, and now Ike GPS. James has a passion to change the way people explore, experience, and collect information about our world. At Ike GPS, James is, is leading that chart with the launch of Spike, a dynamic field GIS measurement and GPS collection solution for mobile devices. So now I'll hand over to you, James. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Matt. Please just get a quick uh, sound check and also that you can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. We've just, we've crossed that easiest of hurdles. Can you see what I'm presenting and can you hear what I'm saying? Well, first, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be with you today and to share with you uh, our technology and, and, and Spike. And also thank you to Geotech Vision uh, for being such a great partner for Ike GPS and, and Spike uh, in bringing our products to, uh, to market in the, in, the, in the Caribbean region. I also wanna take a moment and, and really thank the previous speaker for a really great presentation. And it leads very well into what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, because a spike is also about, about lasers, and I think we can all admit there's really nothing more cooler than, than working with lasers, right? Uh, but the really cool thing about, uh, you know, what you saw in the previous presentation was this really fantastic application of lasers in a way for, for 3D laser scanning to be able to collect information. And spike is similar to that, but extremely different in the way that we go about it, and also in the target market. Uh, that we go ahead and try to address. And so without further ado, let me just really uh, jump into it and address uh, what, is, what is Spike? What is this uh, thing that you may have, may have heard about? Well, what Spike is, is that Spike is a smart measurement solution specifically targeted to people using mobile devices to help them extend the use of their investment in mobile devices, such as smartphones or tablets and allow them to be able to GPS locate and measure objects simply by taking a photo. And so what we have here is a laser attachment. It's uh, pretty inexpensive, it costs $500. Attaches to the back of your smartphone or tablet and then has a single uh, direct stream laser, right? So it's not pulsing, uh, similar to a Leica Disto, uh, if I could uh, borrow a Leica's term for that. And, and be able to point it at an object to create scale and then take photos and then be able to measure right on screen, uh, as you see here, to be able to GPS locate where that sign is and then be able to measure the dimensions of that sign. So, um, the, so the concept is the same, but how we, uh, how we work with that is completely, completely different and how we uh, uh, go out and do that, that, that field, data, field data collection. And a lot of people ask us, uh, you know, why is it that uh, we, uh, why is it that we uh, decided to work with, with smartphones and tablets? Well, there's a good reason for that. And the, the, the number one reason is, is that everyone has them and everybody's trying to do things, different things with them. So how is the, what goes into, what goes into Spike? What is the solution itself? Well, as I already said, it's a laser device that attaches the smartphone or, 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 or tablet, uh, just weighs a little bit over three ounces, connects via Bluetooth to the mobile device and the Spike app. It uses the camera of the mobile device, uses the GPS compass and clinometer that are already in the mobile device to allow people to be able to- Disconnected, connected to mobile device. GPS locate and uh, measure objects for which they wanna measure. So. This is just a simple of, hey, I wanna measure the height of a building or the, the, the width of a silo or the height of a tree, or I wanna uh, do a you know, location of assets in a park, like park benches and other things like that. Just very simple, kind of go out and get, in, go out and get information simply, easily, and expensively. Now with that spike laser device that you have, 
Uh, it works with our Spike app, which is a free app that we have. Uh, and also we have something that's called the Spike Cloud. So if you want to take photos and upload it uh, either to a cloud service and be able to measure on your desktop or tablet, you can go ahead and do that. But that Spike app is free. And once you uh, have your Spike device attached to your mobile device and your Spike app, you have everything you need to point, click, shoot, and measure. And this brings me to our vision for Spike. So why do we build this? Why do we build this, this, this solution in this way? Why do we why do we build a $500 device and release it out into the world and create relationships with groups like Esri and AutoCAD uh, and uh, you know, have great business partners like, like Geotech Vision? Well, we, like a lot of other uh, companies uh, that are out there in the world, just really recognize this megatrend of where people were looking to use their smartphones or tablets more than just in the context of watching videos and email and making phone calls. We have this little mini computer. So how do we take advantage of that? How do we, how do we create uh, new business opportunities and solve difficult solutions in very simple ways? And we chose to be focused on measurement. So how do we allow really anybody to be able to go out and sit there and say, well, how much area is this wall? So perhaps I'm doing facilities management. So I need to know how much, how much paint that I need, how much drywall, or maybe uh, I'm, I'm doing a, uh, uh, asset management, or I'm doing code enforcement or sign inventory. I just need a very simple way to go out and take photos of things, locate those things, measure those things, capture that information, sometimes spatially, sometimes not, and then just get the, the answer that I need. Where is it? How big is it? How much materials might I need? Uh, just simple things like that. And so we're very focused on delivering a unique measuring capability to make a system that's simple and easy to use, for, for anyone. And that's really our claim to fame, if you will. Uh, what we tried to do is create a very simple solution that does very simple things, but delivers the right answers uh, that, you, that you need. And we're very focused on that novice user rather than that expert or that intermediate or that intermediate user. Uh, because we think that that is an area uh, that, that really uh, needs to be addressed. And I'll start to get into this integration that we have with, with Esri and Survey123 for field work. Uh, it is because um, it's really one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, is, is that for the first time, we've built a mobile field data collection solution for geospatial users specifically for the novice user. So what can you do with Spike? Well, remember I said we could do very simple things. And we do very simple things because we want the user experience to be simple easy to train. So you can usually teach somebody how to use Spike in under an hour. But these are just really quickly the functions uh, that we do. Uh, number one is distance to target. How far away is something from the Spike device? Uh, so it's something that you can, uh, you know, do with a tape measure or uh, some or, or other uh, either laser measurement devices that are out there. But, you know, we combine that with a photo and, as well as with location. So I know how far away something is, but I also know where I'm at. Right? So that's the GPS location of the user holding uh, the device. But I can also calculate the GPS location with that distance offset. So for example, here uh, in this photo, uh, you see the user uh, putting it on a manhole, could be a building, could be a tree. Uh, we even have people do it for uh, animals. We've worked with the Jane Goodall Institute uh, to do GPS location of gorillas and chimpanzees and other habitats. Uh, so I can safely collect that information from a, from a distance. So that's distance to target and then GPS location. But then we get into the measurement pieces, the other measurement pieces, which is photo measure, which is measuring on a 2D plane, such as a wall or on the ground. That is photo measurement. Uh, and so that is where we are uh, doing, uh, you know, measuring, you know, measuring, measuring on screen. That accuracy is gonna be around plus or minus 1%. And then there's point to point measurement, which is measuring between two objects in a 3D plane. So, uh, in this example here on screen, we have uh, uh, they point the laser uh, at the first object, which is the rail, then point it at the second object, uh, which is uh, the second rail over here, and it gives you the distance between these two points. And we have a lot of utilities that actually use this uh, to be able to calculate uh, distances between the pole and the house for that last line of cable or, elect or electricity. Uh, but we also have people uh, use that to be able to measure distances between um, inflows and outflows of, of uh, in, in, dra in drainage ditches and things like that for a first state DOT. So these are really cool types of applications. Now, 
you see this plus or minus 1% accuracy and you see with point to point plus or minus 3% accuracy. So uh, what, is, what does that really mean? Now, this is really important to help you to understand where spike fits within your toolkits for measurement. What we mean when we say plus or minus 1% accuracy is that if something measures 10 feet in the real world, well, if you do this over and over and over again, consistently the spike should return a measurement within plus or minus 1% of that. So of either, on either side. And so there's a bit of a, bit of a range there. So it's one of the reasons we talk about spike being an estimation solution rather than a precision solution, right? So if you need something down to an eighth of an inch, and if you need 3D models and all these other things, you absolutely 100% should pay the money to be using precision tools, such as what you saw, uh, which, which we saw before. Just think about it, right? How many times have we had somebody say, right tool for the right job? Spike is a solution where you sit there and say, look, I just need to go out and figure out heights of trees and width of trees in my park. I need to know where those trees are in this park. And I, maybe I need a student to go out and get this, or uh, I need people that are not as trained. I need to go and get construction workers to do this. I need to go out and get um, maintenance people to go out and get this information. These are the types of people that we work to engage them in this type of field data collection rather than employing uh, engineers and servers. Can engineers and servers do this work? Absolutely they can, but one of the interesting things that we have found is, is that there are a lot more maintenance workers than there are engineers and surveyors. And so getting them employed to go out and collect the information when they're maybe going about doing other things or just tasking with these types of field work is, uh, is really important and useful. But anyway, uh, so we have, so, so now that you know what Spike is, why we've built it, here are really some of the applications uh, that we've really exploded in because if you really think about it, that measurement, have just to be able to measure something and be able to locate something simply, quickly, in an estimation kind of way is, is, a, is a huge need out there. And so we've uh, really exploded in everything from thousands, uh, you know, working with thousands of sign and graphics uh, businesses uh, all, around, all around the world, uh, insurance companies, uh, state, local government, federal, defense, intelligence agencies, uh, insurance companies. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work in disaster response for uh, some of these recent uh, uh, hurricanes, uh, other earthquakes and things. We've done a lot of work in, you know, in Puerto Rico, uh, New York City, uh, a, whole, a whole host of things. Because once again, where something is, having a, a record of it, captured in photos, measurements, all that captured together, uh, are all really uh, key, key and useful, useful things. So let me start to share with you a little bit about our relationship with I, well, between IGPS and, 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 and Esri. So about two years ago, we started working with Esri to be able to integrate Spike with Esri mobile field data collections because we have a measurement component and we also have a location component. So. Uh, you know, location plus measurement and other types of information that all equals into geospatial, right? And so Esri was a natural fit for us. And when we sat down to uh, originally to integrate with uh, a, a field data collection solution called Collector, Esri said, you know, we have this really cool thing coming out. It's called Survey123. And it's really aligned in the same way that of, of, of trying to uh, address the needs of a certain user type that you are, that novice user. And so we started to work together and we went out and we started to interview uh, you know, our joint customers, state, local governments, federal, commercial groups and others. And we just kept asking yourself, you know, uh, why aren't you doing more mobile field data collection? And the answer was almost always the same. It was that field data collection is costly, hard, time consuming, resource intense, sometimes not safe. And what we came to realize is, is that field data collection is the Achilles heel for many geospatial professionals. And we would sit down with folks and we would say like, so, so if you're gonna go out and you're gonna collect all the information about your bus stops, what do you do? And then the eye rolls would start, right? And I think I could feel a couple of heads bobbing up and down, right? It's like, okay, wow, I gotta, I gotta set this up. I gotta get the right equipment. I gotta do the training. I have to do all these other things. Now, don't get me wrong. There are absolutely times when you'd absolutely have to do those things, but Sometimes when we're just capturing information, basic information about things or adding information to data that we've already collected, just being able to go out with a $500 device and fill that need 
is really important and really makes a lot of a lot of sense. And so that's what we really targeted with Spike and Survey123. How do we create a very simple user experience that just gives you the simple answers that you are looking for? Uh, the other issue was is that that is that resource heavy component, right, of where uh, we would have a lot of GIS professionals say, well, we rely upon our engineers and surveyors to get information. Well, engineers and surveyors are great. They really are. Uh, but they're an expensive resource and there's not that many of them. So what if we could figure out a way to get the answers that a geospatial professional needed to make decisions, but just employ different people to go about doing it, just simplify that, simplify that process. And that's how we came up with this integration between Spike and Survey123, where uh, we tried to make it easy and we tried to make it uh, uh, you know, simple to execute and easy to scale. Now, because we're talking about estimation, we're talking about um, you know, using something like Spike, isn't it? which is once again an estimation solution, uh, you're giving things up you know, when it comes to precision, but you don't always need that level of precision. So once again, remember, right tool, right job. And so in 2019, I was, was really flattered to be able to receive the Improved Field Operations Award for the ESRI Partner Conference, because what we did is we just came up with a really simple, intuitive way to collect information. Now, if you're not familiar with Survey123, uh, let me just share with you is, is that it is a bit different than Collector. Uh, Survey123 is form-based, where Collector uh, you know, is, is more of an interface you know, directly with GPS and uh, other, uh, you know, and, and collecting GPS information, turning into vector information. Survey123 is a little bit different from that. It's an intuitive, uh, you know, form, you know, form-based mobile collection app that allows you to collect GPS information, allows you to be able to collect information of, you know, of, of measurement, no matter how you do that, or other types of things that you can type in to create uh, characteristics of a, you know, of a, of a, uh, of a point uh, or of a linear feature or a polygon. But much like with, uh, um, with, you know, with Spike, it's, it's an app that you can get from Google Play or the, uh, or, or the Apple Store. Uh, supports integration, like I said, with, with Ike. It's easy to, uh, to, um, to add in, right? So when you're creating a form, you just create a question that says to use Spike to be able to collect this information. And you see this little icon here? Uh, that allows you to be able to click that, which then activates the Spike app that then allows you to be able to take photos, do your measurements like you see here, and then collect that information and see how those, those measurements are collected in numerical value, but also are superimposed or embossed on the photo itself. So what's really cool about this is that for the first time, we can actually see where our measurements are coming from. So have you ever gotten measurements of something or gotten the location of something and looked at it and questioned it and said, hmm, I don't know if that's really correct. Well, now you can see that we combine those two pieces those two pieces together. And the workflow is really as simple as this, is, is that I create my form in Survey123. I have my spike uh, that, I ha that I've set up. So I have my mobile phones, I have my, my spike units, I have the apps all loaded. I go out into the field, I see something that I wanna collect with spike, I click the spike icon, I take the photo, I draw the measurements on screen, that's all captured automatically with the forms. So the photos, the measurements, they all populate the forms automatically. Right, and then I continue on with my field QAQC process, and then over into the into my uh, my uh, my Esri my Esri database. It's really just that simple. I'm really proud of it because, like I said before, uh, is is that for the first time we've created a mobile field data collection solution specifically for that novice user. So, how are people going out and collecting? Or what are they What are they doing? How are they collecting information? So, we've really had a wide range of things, and I'll just touch on a few here, uh, but. The, some of the top ones has been uh, emergency management and disaster response. So being able to go out into the field, being able to take photos of buildings that are damaged, capture that information, document that, 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 that information, and then because we're collecting GPS location with a distance offset, be able to capture that information from a safe distance and then tie that to a parcel, and then be able to uh, roll that up into uh, capturing information uh, about that particular property. Code compliance is another one. Uh, you know, is you know, is a you know, how, uh, you know, is a is a fence is a fence damaged? Is it too high? Is it not in the correct right of way? Uh, utilities, uh, vegetation management, is veg vegetation encroaching? Where is that vegetation? And here is a photo for reference, so I can uh, you know, 
really share and communicate information about what I might want to have done uh, with that vegetation. Facilities management is another one. Uh, you heard me talk about painting and drywall, right? So uh, being able to calculate uh, the area of a, uh, you know, of a wall or even of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a building. But funny enough, we've actually done quite a bit also with natural resources. So you heard me mention earlier about working with the Jane Goodall Institute. So we actually have worked with the USDA, some nonprofit organizations uh, to be able to capture information about um, uh, within a picture uh, to be able to do counts of wildlife or even be able, this was a really interesting, and this is a real case study that's on our website about calculating um, capturing information about uh, the, the holes in trees that woodpeckers use because they have to be of a certain size of a certain height and being able to document where that habitat is to be able to track their their movement so it's a really it's a wide ranging uh, thing and once again I go back to this whole thing of that that measurement of location being so ubiquitous but also being able to do that from a safe distance right because I think everyone would agree nobody wants to climb a dead tree or get too close to some electrical equipment, or sometimes it's just more convenient to collect information that way. Um, but we've even worked with quite a few nonprofits to be able to calculate and you know be able to measure and document uh, things from refugee camps, uh, 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 you, know, you know, mining, uh, you know, mine, uh, you know, uh, personnel, mine reclamation. Uh, we've been able to help out with that uh, quite a bit as well, uh, and we're really proud of those applications, and we're really. Uh, you know, very you know, proud of the way that we've been able to enable a whole segment that's been very difficult to reach for a lot of technology companies, which is very simple, straightforward solutions, help people get the answers that they need uh, and do that in a very uh, simple and easy way. So with that, I think I am on time. And so I'm going to pause now for uh, any sort of Q&A. But before we get to the Q&A, my contact information is up here. Happy to have conversations with you. Uh, we have a great, uh, uh, to see videos about Spike and see the applications of Spike. We have a great uh, YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and just Google Spike by Ike GPS, that'll give you all the information you need. And then of course, the wonderful people at Geotech Vision are fantastic resources as well, to be able to help consult with you about mobile field data collection and help you determine as to whether a, you know, using Spike is the right solution for you or whether you need to use something like you saw before in the previous uh, presentation with that 3D laser scan to do those fantastic 3D models and 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 uh, you know and build some great things, or sometimes maybe even use both. So uh, with that, I, I hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you, thank you, James. Um, reminder to persons: you can post your questions in the chat, and we'll ask. And there is another Q and A happening at the end of our presentations as well. Uh, currently, I'm not necessarily, well, I mean, I have a question, James, and just for reference, how, how long does one of those devices last, pr provided that you're, you're getting constant use in the field? Well, there's, uh, so it takes about two hours to charge, and then it lasts about four hours of continuous use. So that's literally, uh, you know, going, you know, spike photo, spike photo, spike photo, spike photo for four hours straight. I don't know anybody that has the stamina or the willpower to do that, but it easily lasts for a full field day. Uh, and we've had groups such as the uh, Jane Goodall Institute, the National Park Service, and others use it for days on end without recharging on a you know with a typical uh, with a typical use. Uh, and I've been had really good success with uh, being able to uh, recharge that using solar power and other things. So it's really really quite flexible and, and does a nice job out in the field. Okay, thanks, James. Um, remember, guys. Thank you. Have our questions? You can post it in the chat, and even if you send it while we move on, we we'll come back to it again in our next Q and A. But I don't see any at the moment. So, thanks again, James. And if not, I guess we can move to our next presenter. Let me ensure that he is on. Okay. All right, he is here. So let me introduce. Okay, so Mr. Let me get this correctly. Bupati Rapulu is yes. Good. Is the senior business development manager at Cyan. 
He has over 20 years of experience in technology solutions, consulting, sales, and account management. He has incubated multiple technology solutions underpinned by GIS, AI, and advanced analytics and delivered to customers across aerospace, transportation, heavy engineering, medical utilities, and communication industries. Upati is the author of The Race for Work, Escape Automation, Transform Your Career, and Tribe in the Second Machine Age. You know, you can follow him at Upati on Twitter, and I know he'll give more contact information. But I now hand over to you, Upati. Thank you, Josiah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, as uh, Josiah introduced, uh, my name is Bhupati Rapalu from Scient. I'm based in Indianapolis in the US, um, representing Scient's uh, geospatial uh, industry uh, on behalf of predominantly uh, go to market account management and sales perspective. Scient uh, is a global engineering services uh, and data management uh, company. Uh, we serve uh, multiple industries, uh, uh, including aerospace, rail transportation, uh, heavy engineering, uh, island gas, energy, utilities, uh, telecommunications, uh, uh, among others. So among this, we predominantly either design uh, the engineering assets, uh, machines, uh, and, uh, and the related uh, uh, stuff, or we provide data services, including the geospatial data services. So I represent the geospatial uh, business unit, uh, which uh, I'm gonna talk about some of our uh, elite solutions here. Uh, predominantly, uh, the focus of this discussion today is uh, one of our geospatial solutions called 5G inventory planning, we call it 5G IP uh, for communications uh, industry. So uh, let's jump right into it. I think that uh, tells uh, nicely with the discussion of uh, today, uh, mapping for the future. So uh, in terms of uh, a brief overview of science in geospatial industry spectrum, we, uh, uh, we are uh, in the business of capturing the data, managing the data, and exploiting the data at a high level. So we, we do provide data acquisition uh, in terms of uh, aerial data, be it satellite, uh, fixed wing, rotary wing, drone based, and mobile mapping uh, as well. So uh, mobile uh, LIDAR and imagery acquisition, uh, we, we, we extensively deal with such services and managing the data in terms of uh, curating, storing, processing, uh, and providing uh, either offline or online cloud-based access to this data services. And uh, finally, exploiting the data in terms of building geospatial applications uh, in terms of uh, uh, either uh, a simple data services or uh, advanced analytics and geo enabled uh, artificial intelligence services we provide and one of that solution one of that uh, exploitation uh, uh, solution is the 5g ip solution that i'm going to talk about uh, in some time So if you see the communication industry today, 5G planning is um, a major uh, trend. I don't know if this is blocking you. Let me just uh, minimize. Hope it's just, uh, I, I'm not sure if the audio comes and goes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I'm hearing you, but it just comes and goes. I'm not sure if there was something. OK, let me go a bit closer. And, uh, all right, so communications industry is uh, undergoing a rapid transformation in terms of uh, 5G deployment. So 5G uh, is a revolution that you're gonna see uh, from now and for possibly in the next decade. And for that uh, communications industry it requires to do a large scale high level planning first in terms of where to deploy their uh, uh, antenna, small cells, uh, fiber underground. Uh, so the whole sort of uh, equipment deployment requires RF simulation planning at a high level. For this, they need to know the 
possible locations for deploying their assets. So usually it is the poles. So the poles, including their location, exact coordinates, composition, uh, what kind of pole it is, and then availability of space around and who owns that pole, is it utilities, the communication company uh, themselves or any third party poles. So deploying the field technicians to go and identify those uh, potential poles for 5G deployment is an expensive, time consuming and uh, uh, you know, error prone activity. Scientists come up with uh, the 5G deployment solution, which uh, is basically using the aerial imagery uh, and uh, extracting all the poles that can be visually seen uh, from this imagery automatically and then uh, making it available. The data is available to the communication uh, uh, planners, uh, field staff. So uh, usually we provide um, less than one meter accuracy of the clusters of poles for our simulation planning, uh, 5G cell, uh, small cell deployment. This, uh, this solution can be scaled up quickly across uh, regions, states, and even countries uh, because uh, the data is mostly processed by uh, artificial intelligence driven algorithms. And then uh, a human in the loop where uh, our engineers would do uh, or would run a few uh, quality control checks and also some manual inspections to ensure the required accuracy. So visually, uh, we provide 99% uh, or more uh, accuracy, both in terms of completeness and correctness of the availability of polls. In fact, the 5G IP is uh, a part of our larger solution called Virtual Walkout. Uh, so virtual Walkout is a 3D, three-dimensional uh, uh, planning tool uh, it, it comes with uh, 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 360 degree view of the LIDAR and imagery on the roads uh, in which you can identify the assets, measure the assets and extract the assets for uh, planning uh, purposes. So this is predominantly for uh, utilities and telecommunication companies where they can navigate through uh, virtually and uh, do perform their uh, planning activities. In case if it is uh, communications, they can do fiber planning activities from uh, their uh, operation center all the way until to the home. So uh, an, uh, from that virtual walkout solution, an extract of uh, that solution is the 5G IP where is a lightweight uh, solution, cloud-based solution for high-level planning of identifying all the poles in a given region. Quickly, uh, the architecture is basically uh, split into two uh, um, broad areas. One is the acquisition of the data and uh, automated extraction using machine learning. The second is uh, asset identification and analysis. So acquisition predominantly in this case, we use uh, aerial imagery, uh, even though we can use satellite imagery to some extent, uh, but if you want to get uh, higher accuracy, both in terms of completeness and correctness, we prefer using aerial imagery, uh, usually uh, 7.5 centimeters uh, or less resolution. Uh, and uh, if, if it is for even robust uh, planning and deployment, we can also use street mobile LIDAR uh, for uh, highly accurate uh, planning. For just for identification of poles, we use uh, aerial imagery and then uh, automatically extract the poles. And then we put, uh, we run that into uh, various uh, quality control checks in terms of you know, uh, sequencing of the poles. If a pole is missing uh, from the imagery, either because of tree coverage or any other uh, uh, coverage that uh, uh, a human eye or an algorithm cannot look at the pole, but that can still be extracted using uh, a set of geospatial uh, rules. Uh, it can be sequencing, it can be, it can be network, network topology, or it can be, uh, or even uh, depending on uh, both the domain specific or GIS specific rules that we have, uh, a library of tools we have, a library of rules we have. Using that, we increase the completeness and correctness of the data. And then finally, put that into our uh, uh, planning and analysis uh, modules where you can do uh, uh, various uh, sets of uh, uh, 
planning to, uh, jobs, for example, how many poles are there in a particular area? And if I deploy my small cell on this particular pole, what would be the uh, RF coverage uh, in terms of uh, you know, number of customers covered, in terms of the strength of the signal? So such kind of analysis tools are also available uh, in 5 gap just coming back to the source of data and uh, the relative accuracy, as you see here. So satellite uh, usually uh, gives uh, uh, five meters uh, or all the way below to 30 centimeters accuracy. Uh, that could give us only to, you know, uh, identifying a pole under five meters uh, in, in horizontal accuracy. But if we, if we take an aerial imagery, Usually, uh, it is between 7.5 centimeters to 50 centimeters horizontal accuracy. That would give us uh, identifying uh, the poles under under one meter uh, uh, accuracy. But even further going, if we uh, can capture ground-based mobile lidar and imagery, uh, usually uh, our uh, imagery is 100 uh, megapixel, uh, 360 degree imagery we capture. Using that, we can identify poles uh, as close as uh, under 10 centimeters uh, horizontal accuracy. So uh, various uh, methods we use depending on the specific customer's requirement uh, and also the price point. Obviously, if we are using either aerial or even satellite, the, it, it's going to be much cheaper. And this is uh, useful for large scale uh, pole identification, let's say across a state or even a country. So quickly, the uh, benefits include uh, basically identification of the poles uh, at, at a very uh, low cost uh, compared to manual uh, field visits or any kind of uh, manual data acquisition processes. It's available on the cloud. Uh, you can navigate through uh, and identify the poles and download the poles into various uh, file formats, uh, GIS file formats. And uh, uh, you can also perform spatial analysis on the portal or you can download it and do it uh, on ArcGIS and native tools as well. Uh, predictable pricing, we have a tired pricing, but uh, uh, it starts with uh, 45 cents per poll uh, at the lowest volume. And as you uh, increase uh, the uh, region and in terms of area, the price even further drops down. So the 45 cents per pole is the uh, maximum for 100 square kilometers or under square miles um, area. So uh, again, uh, going further, uh, if uh, if uh, any uh, user is planning to uh, use this data for uh, low level design planning, uh, apart from this planning, we also embed the street mobile lighter that can be used along with the same data side by side for more accurate uh, planning, for example, if you plan with the fiber in terms of identifying the length of the cable, placement of the cable, uh, and uh, you know, planning of uh, assets uh, uh, next to a tower or a pole. This is uh, possible by embedding the LiDAR point cloud uh, and this is a classified LiDAR point cloud within the application. Uh, a few uh, key features of the solution, um, uh, it's uh, available on the cloud built on uh, SDR GIS platform. So it is a uh, native interface. Uh, all the features, the navigation uh, are quite similar to SRE, so user doesn't need any learning curve here. You see, uh, once you log in, you have uh, 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 one thing is the areas on the top right corner, uh, what are, uh, whatever areas are available uh, in the system already. Uh, we have an option to subscribe as well, and for, where you can log in and choose an area and just draw the polygon and submit, and we get a uh, request to provide the poll data for that area. Or it can happen offline as well. You can request uh, that a particular city or state you need poll data, and we go ahead and uh, process the data and uh, make it available in a, in a few weeks, depending on the size uh, of the uh, area. And then you see here the uh, polls identified and classified uh, uh, into various categories. 
the like utility poles, lamp posts, traffic lights, communication towers, and you know, communication poles. Uh, they are embedded uh, in various uh, backgrounds as well. So you see, you see here, uh, it is a, a simple uh, base map or a, a satellite map, or even you have various other options uh, to uh, choose from. Uh, there are some of them are uh, open source free, and some of them are uh, procured by Scient here. Uh, for example, uh, you also have a very high resolution base map uh, imagery available just for building the context and uh, uh, effective planning purposes. So we, we anyway go and uh, we procure this aerial imagery from uh, uh, other vendors for uh, our data processing. So we will use this uh, here in this application so that end users can benefit from it uh, along with the poll data and also the uh, embedded uh, base, base map. The dashboard shows uh, high level statistics uh, in terms of the total number of poles. Uh, there's some average figures also available. Once you select an area, they will get populated uh, with respect to that particular area. And also the classification uh, in terms of uh, the pole type, lamp post, utility pole, traffic lights now. So, uh, um, Again, uh, the analysis tools uh, I was uh, talking about, where uh, you know, it talks about uh, once you select an area, uh, you, you get to know uh, the number of poles to begin with. And uh, from there, uh, in terms of uh, various uh, small analysis uh, aspects, in terms of uh, propagation, uh, RF propagation, uh, how many customers are included within the area, those tools are uh, available here. Uh, if you click on any particular poll, uh, there are uh, specific attributes in terms of exact latitude and longitude uh, when it was uh, extracted. Uh, and uh, we also provide uh, uh, some third party additional attributes uh, by taking the services. Uh, so uh, this is also a possible. Uh, open platform where you can upload your data. So, so when, when we go to uh, communication service providers, often they, they already have some poll data and they wanted to see if that is complete or not. So we have given a provision where uh, users can upload their poll, poll data here and see the delta, how far it is complete, uh, what is the delta, how much they can uh, uh, they need to procure uh, from, from this system. And if they want to modify this data, uh, add some additional features and see it here for further analysis purposes, they can uh, modify and upload here and you see additional attributes here. So uh, in a nutshell, that's uh, about uh, 5G inventory planning solution. We have customers in, uh, in the US and also in Canada. Uh, we've been uh, working with multiple uh, communication service providers uh, in the planning stage right now. So typically when uh, customers uh, uh, give us a, a heads up in terms of uh, uh, in terms of a specific area of interest, be it a city or a group of cities, um, we will provide that almost on demand. Uh, if, it's, uh, if the data is already acquired, prepared, we will just extend the access. If it is not acquired, uh, we put that into production process, which takes usually around uh, two to three weeks per uh, uh, per thousand square miles of uh, area. So that's about uh, 5G inventory planning. I think I'm under the time. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, again, this is. Uh, Bhupati uh, Rapalu from Scient. Uh, all the details are available on our website. So I, I will encourage you to go to Scient uh, uh, website for uh, uh, additional details. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Bhupati. Um, well, we still have some time. Um, if persons have questions, they can, you know, Put it in the chat. And just a question, Bupati. Seeing as you have created solutions for 5G, and we know 5G is something now 
really, I won't say now in the Western world, but Apple just released their new first 5G phone. So you're seeing that that technology is, is heading in that direction. One question, I understand 5G because it's high frequency, it covers smaller areas. So I'm assuming even if we try to make the Caribbean smart and take 5G even to the Caribbean region, um, do you see any current limitations in, in, in that aspect, provided that the solution is already there? As you said, the data is already collected. It's just, is, is it a more of a matter of the communication industry or private organizations working with um, the public, et cetera? So, yeah, it's, uh, that's a great question you know, in terms of uh, uh, readiness for 5G uh, IP. So the technology is uh, uh, there, though it is nascent, it is rapidly evolving. Uh, 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 predominantly, it's uh, communication industries, uh, uh, business analysis, I would say, you know, the cost versus benefit analysis that they, have, uh, they make a decision on uh, investing in deployment of this 5G network. Uh, and uh, if they're confident that, okay, in a, in a, in a remote area or in a, in, a, in a specific part of the geography, they would uh, uh, make a decision on going for 5G deployment. Once they decide that it is cost effective, they're gonna benefit from that. The second uh, step in that is basically planning. So, how, and that is where it comes. So it, uh, the cost versus benefit decision is depending on the assumption that, okay, how much, uh, uh, what, are, what tools I have as a communication service provider uh, to uh, deploy this network. And that cost versus what is the benefit I get in terms of uh, revenues from the end users. So we are going, we are planning to change that assumption. We are planning to uh, provide a solution that significantly reduces the cost of 5G IP deployment. So this, this solution enables you know, automatically identifying uh, the poles, I, uh, uh, placement of the small cells that gives maximum coverage to the customers so that you, you, have, you need minimum number of cells and uh, small cells and you know exactly where to place the small cells and ultimately reduce the cost of 5G deployment. Okay, great. And, and, and quickly before we move on, um, this same solution can identify, I, I, I'm assuming, the regular poles, so we can... Yeah, absolutely. This, this just for poles, yeah. So even for companies that are interested in, in identifying these solutions. Um, absolutely. So, fi yeah, fi uh, right. 5G IP is, uh, 5G uh, planning is the default uh, um, use case, but this can be applied to any other use cases where somebody needs to have a poll. For example, utility companies want to know uh, what are all the third party attachments out there on their poles. Because uh, if a communication company is using utility poll for placing their cable or in a fiber, yeah, communication companies have to pay to utilities. Often this data is uh, not well maintained and uh, utilities lose a lot of uh, revenue but, uh, because of that. So this solution can provide utilities identify their poles and also third party attachments that are there on their poles so that uh, they can uh, increase their revenue, uh, you know, uh, bill to the customers appropriately. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Vupati. And reminder to persons, um, the link is in the chat. Uh, fill it out. We have prizes to give away as well as any you have you can put it in the chat we have a q a session after this presentation um we're off to our final presenter um so uh without further ado i will introduce valerie grant and she is the founder and managing director of geotech vision an ict and special technologies company in kingston jamaica and georgetown guyana and now in florida in the u.s and uh, they are focused on delivering value through innovative solutions. With over 15 years of experience in the geospatial sciences, with engagement spanning several territories across the region, varies helping government and corporate entities to develop data-driven solution, geospatial solutions to address organizational challenges and meet corporate goals. And I mean, Valerie, oh yes, you're here. here. All right, so over to you, Valerie. 
All right. Thanks, Josiah. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning, our first stop of this virtual roadshow. So you've heard a lot of heavy technology this morning. You've heard some for the novice, and, to, and now I'm just going to give you some that is not so heavy, but just telling you some of the things that we do and the value of location. So that's my purpose here this morning. So I'm going to start out with saying a famous um, phrase that was coined in the UNGGIM, everything happens somewhere. And that phrase could not be more true. The reality is that location is such, so pervasive and this is a constant part of everything that we do. I like to ask persons what they did in the last 24 hours that didn't have a location component to it. And every time I ask that question, people think about it and they recognize that literally almost everything we do have some kind of location associated with it. So the fact is, location is really at the center, and that is why we're all here. And I know that there are different levels of users who are actually on the call this morning. Some of, some of you are more appreciative as to the value of location, but some of you really want to understand how location can really impact the profitability of your organization and hence make your organization a lot location smarter to do that. So having said that, location is really at the center because it's so pervasive. And so today it is mainstream. I'm using a mobile phone um, illustration to demonstrate that it's really at the center. How often do we pick up that mobile phone? And when we pick up the mobile phone, we realize that um, we want to use it to map where we're going. We want to get some directions to somewhere or something else. But the reality is that we are using some form of location data, whether it is in food delivery, whether it's finding out where we're going, whether it is to, to, to book an Airbnb, whatever it is, we're using location. So it is mainstream. And there is a lot of hidden value that is there in our location data. The reality is that we have so much data that's there, but 80% of that data has a spatial component. That's what has been noted. Um, and addressable information exists in many of our organizations. We may not be aware of it. We also may not be aware of some of the ways in which we're using location data. And we may not recognize it, but the recognition of that location intelligence can be extracted as the other presenters have highlighted today. And this can really drive a lot of location-based applications. So, Location, really, whether we want to think about it or not, location is mainstream. And so there are many multi-billion dollar industries that are built on that location data. We only have to think about Uber, we think about Google, we think about all of the other industries that are using data. And companies, big and small, have been finding several ways to use that data. We all use location data every day, even without us being aware of it. We talk about natural disasters. We talk about maybe having a power outage. If that is the case, then the utility company is using the behind the scenes location data to know who to notify as to what blocks will be affected by that outage. So we are, being, we are using that data every single day in things that we do, even without us being aware of it. So there is in fact a big location opportunity. And many of us are missing that opportunity, especially at smaller businesses. The fact is, your competition, your supply and your demand, your consumer demographics are all things that impact the bottom line. What do they all have in common? It's based on location, right? And with intelligent maps and location analysis, you can better understand these variables and be able to apply them a lot more. So understanding what trends are shifting, where markets are, where there are service gaps, gives us many opportunities. For example, location has become critical amidst COVID. Now, a lot of persons had supply chains that were in Asia. Is it because of location? Would they be now looking for supply chains that are more near shore, that are maybe markets within the Caribbean? How does that impact what you're doing? How does that impact a company, say, in New York, um, as opposed to a company in Florida that may be closer to a market, given the situations that we're having with COVID and this time and disruption of supply chain. So location, com it comes back to location. Again, 
it also comes back to the location of some of your existing customers, your products, your produce, all of these things. So location has a real opportunity. And one of the things that we're seeing is that it is bringing value to a wide range of industry. These include things like our financial services. They are using it to do risk assessment. They are using it to do um, investment analysis. They are using it to do geo marketing in real estate. Similarly, they are using it to do geo marketing, data monetization, price optimization, retail. You've heard about site planning, but Pity talked about it when it requires for 5G. But it can be for simple thing as site selection. It can be for your indoor mapping, your supply chain design, as well as the, we are using it in transportation and logistics, your mobile planning, your district or territory management, your, your fleet routing and tracking, healthcare. That's something that every day you turn on your television, you see a map. So you understand that you're using location data. The reality is that everything to do with COVID is being presented to us by way of a map. And if you're also watching the television and you're looking at US elections, you also know that everything to do with that is being presented by way of a map. Those things emphasize the value of location. And so why aren't more organizations incorporating that and twinning it with their business intelligence to affect the bottom line? So, at Geotech Vision, some of the things that we help you to do is to do exactly that. We are that perfect combination of mixing your talent with our vast network of resources, some of whom you have seen here today on this webinar, and helping you to bring out that intelligence in your data. We also not just help you to, to, to to make sure that we can geo-enable and bring out the location intelligence in your data. But we'll even help you to develop your location intelligence strategy. We'll help you to make sure that you can integrate your location information across the different business areas that you have. And we're in fact just an extension of your office. We are the persons who you can come to for your location intelligence coaching. Because I know that this concept is very new to many of you. So we will help you through all of that. And we also provide you with the necessary training that it will take to get you there so that you can make sure that you're using your location information effectively that you already have in your organization, but some of you may not be aware of it. So we help you to one, extract it, and to two, use it effectively so that we can impact the bottom line. And not just impacting the bottom line, tie to things like your sustainability strategy, and make sure that you're in fact contributing to the sustainable development goals at the end of the day and measure them. So those are some of the things that the location information helps you to do. So location information is critical to business. It can help you to save money, it can help you to save time, and it definitely helps you to make better decisions. So the point is, if we think about a spatial context, we're really thinking about location, we're thinking about proximity, we're thinking about distance. Why does it really matter? Because it helps you to see, it helps you to plan, to visualize, to operate, and to economize the costs, the time to execute a given project. So when you think about forecasting, you're thinking about what new properties are you wanting to develop? Where are they located? How many are there? Can you actually establish a new infrastructure to support that growth? It helps you to have that engine that you can do various types of scenario analysis. All of that is what it gives. And this just gives you an idea. Yes, you can do some of this without um, using maps, but certainly a picture tells a thousand words. And so the maps helps you to bring that tabular data to life so that when you're speaking with decision makers, they can actually quickly see what it is that you're, uh, you're speaking about and it comes to life and it makes the point a lot clearer than looking at just a table that may say the same thing, but you then have to dig deeper into it. So that's really the value of having the location-based solution or your geospatial solution. It helps you with better data management and integration of your work processes. And so this is what we are here to help you with. We are your location 
um, ally in this regard. And so we wanted on this first stop of our roadshow to emphasize that and to bring you some of our partners, which we've done to show you some of our capabilities. And not only that, to show you some of the things and how we've been using some of the different areas. So we've spoken about a lot of things this morning and I just kind of want to put it all together. And so I'm gonna show you, share with you a brief video here um, that speaks about the welcome to the future. It's a video uh, with, um, Autodesk and IBM. So let's play. All right, so that just basically gave you an overview as to some of the things that you've heard about this morning. You've seen some of them twin and just bringing a lot of it together um, as to some of the things that we can actually help you with. And so when we think about GIS and building information modeling, we're thinking about how you, 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 you do things in a very holistic way. You've seen the whole matter of how we can create those digital twins using the 3D laser scans, how we can um, create as built of what that is and help you with real-time collaboration. That was emphasized this morning. And so this is just an, an example of a workflow that we've been testing out with a particular airport and you know your 3D scans, your building information modeling, connecting things like your camera information, and you would be able to just add hyperlinks and geotag each of these. You'd be able to, to basically do some kind of um, artificial intelligence so that you can maximize and also optimize the work that you're doing in terms of not having to have eyeballs on the camera all the time, but making sure that they are different alert. So some of the use cases include things like having your machine learning engine, making sure that you are also able to have um, full-time forensic indexing from all of your different video feeds, analytics of your cameras in motion, um, whether those be drones, whether they be your PTZ cameras or body-worn cameras. Also making sure that you, um, during time of COVID, because it's so much in our minds, we can't do a presentation without talking about it. Um, you can have your analytics that helps you to reduce the risk of COVID, especially in an airport. I know um, being a person who used to be on a plane almost every week, and now not being on a plane for several months, I definitely want to feel safe the next time I travel. So you want to be able to estimate your, the occupancy and the social distancing and, and airports that are doing that make people feel a lot more comfortable because you're able to monitor the number of persons entering and leaving and have the alerts. And when the, those thresholds are exceeded, 
alert if a distance between people are too small. And this is not just applicable to airports, but I'm using it as an example. It could be applicable to other businesses, but airports is a place that you have lots of persons. And so it's a good example. Um, fever monitoring, track the motion of a fever positive person. Um, making sure that people are PPE compliant, monitor the proper use of the PPE and ensure that there is an alert if they are not compliant. And things like your sanitation, prioritize where disinfection and action needs to be done by doing priority mapping. These are all things that we are able to assist you with along with our partners. And other use cases include things like your journey, your customer journey heat maps, your, your queue management, inventory of out of stock items, um, figuring out the item remaining in a basket at checkout, monitoring of restricted area, making sure that there is not a tripping hazard in a particular aisle. Along with AI, these are all things that we're busy working on at Geotech Vision. So why location intelligence? The answer is simple. We don't want to simply depend on gut feeling, not in this age when there's so much data available. We want to make sure that we are making decisions that are based on facts. You can make informed decisions that contribute to greater profitability when you use your location intelligence. The point is, we're able to create better insights, which leads to better decisions. And for governments, these decisions will lead to better governance. And for businesses, the better decisions will inevitably lead to greater profitability. And as a business person myself, then you know that at the end of the day, the bottom line is important. So we want to be that partners with you as we help you to make your location, your organization a lot more location smarter. I will leave you with this last video before we take some question and answers. Let's start that again. History tells us that the value shift is triggered by a new story of how we want to live. The world is changing in front of our eyes and technology is leading a revolution one that will be greater than any we've ever seen. We are now in the fourth industrial revolution. And the beauty of this is that it doesn't change what we're doing, but it changes us. Digitization is already impacting businesses. And geospatial technology is getting all pervasive and default in our daily lives. Artificial intelligence, Internet of Things and big data are changing economies, industries, societies and the way we live. This revolution will multiply and be far more advanced with breakthroughs in sectors such as 3D printing, robotics, blockchain, autonomous vehicles, and more. It's the ability of these technologies to change outcomes, to truly empower people all over the world, to drastically improve the efficiency of businesses and organizations. This will help regenerate the natural environment through better asset management, which would result in better governance and achieving the sustainable development goals. The world's emerging cities will have the potential to deliver a sustainable future for all. If our policymakers intelligently harness the rapid and disruptive technological change of the fourth industrial revolution, Geospatial data and technologies aspires to be an integral part of this disruptive journey. Imagine a world where smart and connected will be a norm. Where effective environmental monitoring will make breathing easier and our surroundings more livable. A world where machines like expert systems and digital assistants will change manufacturing processes 
a world where adoption of automation will be the only path. A world that will talk back to you. The world is getting ready for a whole new world. Are you? All right, so we want to be the ones to help you get ready for that whole new world. So with that, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, we, um, we suggest you guys put the questions in the chat uh, so we can easily grab those and ask it to the relevant persons. It can be towards, well, I know James is still here. Oh yes, Joel is here. Uber is here, so um, any questions you guys have? Anything related to services, you know, presented or how you can see your organization benefiting from these services? We're open to questions. And also a reminder for persons who just join, there is a link in the chat for a survey, we encourage you guys to fill that out. That is what is going to help us decide the winners of the different prizes and giveaways we have today. So be sure to fill that out. Um, yeah, and win some great prizes. And Josiah, just to say, I hear that we are giving away some spike devices, which James spoke about this morning, and he demonstrated that you didn't have to be a professional to be able to use it. So that seems like a great prize to me. Yeah, I, I believe we have another prize already with regards to a tablet. Oh yeah, so you get the opportunity to get one of our Geo tablets. Um, it's our very own brand and it is tried and proven and you get the chance to win one of those tablets and we know that those are in high demand these days, so yeah. Yes guys. Uh, if you guys aren't seeing the link, I just posted it again in the, in the chat. So you can fill that out. Um, we'll get the information and we'll contact you. Well, the winners, it's, it's a variety of prizes. And um, just to mention, you know, to get in contact about any of these solutions, you can also reach out to us after this. We are open to questions at any point um, to help you guys really integrate these smart solutions in taking your, well, making your organization smarter and um, just really, you know, helping you along that transition in this digital transformation that's currently happening. I believe, so no questions, I don't see any. Yes. So everything was absolutely clear to everyone, so no questions, okay. Thank you. I see someone said good presentation. Thanks. Thank you for that. So we're happy and we're here to answer any of the questions that you may have after you've had the opportunity to digest what it is. Um, we'll also make the video um, recording of this session available for those who may want to view sections of it at a later time as well. Yes, and just remember, this is just our first stop. We will be having um more of these especially you know november is a big month with gis and stuff like that so do look out for more information as well for our, our other you know virtual road shows um we intend to bring you guys a lot of offerings a lot of solutions we know that this is a you know uncertain time period but we are here to overcome that as an organization we are you know with the help of our partners taking those steps. I believe, okay, yeah, someone asked about the video. So yeah, we will make that available. All right. So I guess if there are no other questions, then we just um, hand over to Sherry or just Josiah so that we can wrap up. Sherry, are you there? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. All right, so um, thank you, Valerie, for that lovely presentation. Thank you, Josiah. And to all our attendees this morning, afternoon, or night, wherever you are in the world, we would like to thank you for attending. 
special thanks to our partners as well for taking the time out to share insights on the technologies available through Geotech Vision, which are designed with efficiency in mind. Today, we have a need for investments which have a broad application usage and ultimately can boost productivity by having a simplified yet effective workflow for your staff. And what we have learned today from our different presenters is that there is tremendous value in location insights and its associated technologies. And as Valerie said, location is at the center of everything and it can impact your organization at different levels. Real estate, financial, marketing, manufacturing, you name it. So for all of our attendees, before you go, as was mentioned before, we have some prizes for you. And I'll just like to share a quick video. Okay. Seen it now? Yeah. Okay. video as we said before the link should be in the chat so please access that link we'll also be emailing to those who registered for the um roadshow and please note the like a prize that's the first prize it's actually been offered to everyone who is in attendance today so we'd like to just say thanks again this is the end of our first stop of our virtual roadshow i hope you found it informative and interesting and do let us know how we may improve and let us welcome you again to our future events and please be on the look of those invitations. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Josiah. Right, thanks again, Sheree. Um, thanks to all the presenters. Uh, thank you for all those who attended. Um, we, we really appreciate your time. We know the Zoom calls have been overdone for the past few months, but we really, we really believe in networking and connecting with you guys to find solutions. So, because, you know, we are all in this together, trying to tackle 2021, hopefully, um, you know, strong and prepared. And this digital transformation is happening, whether we like it or not. So getting ahead of it and, and really finding how you can make your workflow you know, digital is really important. So we thank you guys again, and we look forward to doing more events like this soon. Uh, do, do be on the lookout, and we will be contacting you guys with the survey and the prize winners as well. So I think that's it. Any closing remarks, Valerie? No, just to say thanks for everyone for spending part of their morning with us or evening or just part of their day. We really appreciate it and we are looking forward to spending some more time with you. We're also looking forward to you joining us for a virtual GIS Day event, which you will hear some more about as well. And for celebrating on, I think our next stop is on November 12th, and that's actually Geotech Vision's anniversary. So at that point in time, we hope that we can really spend some time with you and, and get some things going. So look out for those information and have a great day, everyone. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you and have a great day.